I really enjoyed the book of Daniel so far, just this time through and teaching it, sharing it with you guys. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I hope you've learned something. I hope, I hope this conscious, this idea of, of consciously standing firm and loving well in our, in our culture uh, has kind of resonated with you a little bit and maybe impacted the way that we do our, our day-to-day life, you know, especially the stuff that doesn't seem that important. We know that from Daniel's life. We've seen the example he put forth where everything matters. You know, There's nothing that we do in our life that doesn't matter. So. I'm going, be, I'm going to be sad to, to finish this one, but um, but I'm also excited about our next one. We'll be moving to the book of James next week, and so uh, you could probably read the whole book in about a half an hour today and get ready for next week, so I encourage you to do that. So, All right, I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump in here. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask for your words. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would uh, put your words in, in my mouth and, and let them come out, Lord, that I don't get in the way, that I don't affect them, that I don't uh, change them in any way, Lord. We just ask that your, your will comes forth through this message. Uh, and through the prophetic message that you give to Daniel. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the first six chapters of Daniel we've talked about, are the story of Daniel's life in Babylon. We talked about that last week. Chapter 7 through 12 shift now from, from story to prophecy, to the prophecy that God gave Daniel during his time in Babylon. Um, and, and these prophetic visions that Daniel speaks of regarding what's to come, you know, is, is both for Daniel, but it's, it's for the reader as well. It's for you and I, and for, for all of time, until, until the end comes, this book of Daniel is, is critical to our understanding of, of who God is. Um, chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7 is known by the Jewish scribes as the greatest chapter. They call this the greatest chapter. It gives us a, a sweeping overview, a sweeping view of future history. From, from the day of Daniel all the way until beyond where we are now. It gives us the whole, the whole look. From Daniel's perspective, it was, all, it was all future. Now, from our perspective, it's some past and some future. And so, and so it's kind of an awesome situation that we have with, with prophecy in Daniel because not only is it just a future prophecy that maybe someday we can look at the prophecy and say, that did happen. That did happen as well. Well, so did that. And so did that. But yet here we are, and it's not finished. But we can see how, how all of it has worked up so far. We're in kind of a cool spot in history right now. And, and these, these prophecies of Daniel are some of the most astounding prophecies in all of Scripture. Chapter 7 um, is literally, and I, I talked about this a little bit in the video, this, chapter 7 is like the top of the puzzle box for, for, for prophecy. It shows us the whole picture. Without this, without this chapter, none of the rest of the pieces of prophecy make as much sense. But when we have this puzzle top, this picture of the finished puzzle, all of a sudden we can start plugging in other pieces of prophecy where they belong in this, in this greater picture. And it's, it's important that we pay attention to prophecy, too. Um, God, gives, God doesn't just give prophecy uh, to show off, to show how great he is. We know how great he is. That's not the point of prophecy. God gives us prophecy in Scripture to show us where we're headed from here, but also to prove that the Bible is true. Wow. Think about that for a second. God's word is truly supernatural. Mm -hmm. It's not just what some guys along the history of time decided to write down and contribute to God. Prophecy like this proves the inerrancy and the supernatural element of God's word. It's his. He did it. We're going to see soon that, that what these words say in, in, in Daniel 7 couldn't have come from anyone but God. They couldn't have been guessed or, or uh, whatever. There'd be no other explanation except for the God's holy words given to Daniel. So the book of Daniel, specifically the second half that we're going to dig in today, um, are dealing with prophecy. And this, this chunk of scripture is a battleground uh, for biblical scholars and critics. There's a lot of a lot of folks that want to discount this piece of prophecy. It's important. Uh, the content of chapter 7 through 12 claim to predict the future. And if it's true, which we do believe it is, it's a, it's a supernatural writing. Like I mentioned, this, this is God's literal writing. It's his supernatural power. Tells us things we don't know. Tells Daniel, told Daniel things that he couldn't have possibly known. And so if we believe what we believe, we have to believe this is God's own written word. 
Well, critics don't like that. The book of Daniel is claimed to be written by the Jewish prophet Daniel in the 500s BC. Okay, so he wrote this 500 before 500 BC before Jesus. He wrote this. The prophecy within describes kingdoms and kings and battles that took place and matches history perfectly. So you, a coincidence is one thing. You get hit, hitting the right answer once in a while happens, but he hit it perfectly over and over and over. Critics and scholars alike don't like anything they can't explain. Either. Scientists doesn't, don't like things they can't explain. Something we can't put a, an equation to. We can't work it out on paper. Well, guess what? You can't work the Bible out on paper. You can't work God's word out to make sense because it's not. It's supernatural. It's his, given for our benefit and, his, and for his glory. Over history, we've seen many people try to make claims and discount the supernatural element of prophecy in, in Scripture. They do this by questioning the authority of it. They question the, the authorship of it. They, they question the timing of it. You know, it would be easy to say, well, Daniel wasn't really written by the actual Daniel in 500 B.C. It was actually written by somebody that, that uh, was privy to the information and it was written much later, but they wrote it in a way that, that makes it seem like prophecy. Well, If we believe that, if we believe there's a deception here in the book of Daniel, that, that it wasn't truly written by Daniel, it wasn't truly written when they say it was written. If we believe that, we believe there's deception in the Bible. We believe these words are, are, are a lie. And we're, we're attributing it to God. So what does that say about us? What does it say about, about our belief in Scripture? If we don't believe prophecy, we can't believe the salvation shouldn't have been either. You know, we just had Reformation Day yesterday, and I don't know, we don't talk about this kind of stuff often, but the five solas of, of does anybody, can anybody tell me the five solas of the Reformation right now? I'm sure there's some that can, but I won't put anybody in the spot. First one is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. Okay, so if we don't believe that this scripture alone is enough and true and on point and we can believe every single word of it, then none of the rest of it matters. None of the rest of your faith, none of the rest of what you think you believe matters if we don't believe at all. All of it. We have to believe that scripture is absolutely inerrant. There's no mistakes. There's no, no deception. There's no lies in here. Nothing to mislead. We have to understand that. As followers of the Lord Jesus. We can't, we can't be gray in any area here. It all is true. And it's all God's word. And it's all for his glory. If this, if this is what we believe it is. And was written by who we believe it is. When we believe it was. Man, it's, it's a supernatural writing. It's God's literal writing. Do we understand that? Mm -hmm. when, we, when we read a little bit off scripture and we read something on Facebook, do we realize that that's God's own authorship on that? And it's perfect. The, the stakes of what's that question here are pretty high. Because there's no in between. You can't, you can't believe something not the rest. You can't have, I can't, I can't believe what Jesus said and not believe what Daniel said. Right? Do we get that? The stakes are pretty high. And, and here's, here's some information about this. The first written copy of Daniel was from about 980. So well after Jesus was here and gone. Well after that, 980. And so there's a lot of people that take that and say, well, there's no original nothing from dating it way back there. So how am I supposed to believe it's true? And in 1946, began the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, in a cave off the northwest shore of the Dead Sea, in what we now know as the West Bank. And in those scroll fragments, in the old, ancient chunks of parchment paper that they could barely read, they found the book of Daniel. And the words that they found match the words that we have in our scripture. Amen. 
It gave credibility to everything we know from the Old Testament that maybe we didn't know where it came from or how it got there, but now we have these Dead Sea Scrolls that prove it. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are dated to 1 to 200 AD, or BC, I'm sorry. 1 to 200 BC. There's your proof, skeptics. I'm not calling you a skeptic. I'm saying for those in our country and our world that they're skeptical of, of the inerrancy of the scripture, there's proof. Now, I'm no history authority. I don't know, you know, I'm not going to go down that road too far. But we've got proof. And more so than even the written proof that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have proof written in our hearts. And that's, that's all proof I need. God has showed me over and over. So here, here we are in Daniel 7, and, and there's some big claims getting made. There's some big statements being made in, the, in Scripture. First, it claims to contain God's written word, directly from God himself, given to various men over the years for our, for our uh, throughout history for, and recorded out for our benefit. And secondly, the Bible also claims to predict the future in the form of prophecy, and not just once, not just twice, Repeatedly, the Bible claims to predict the future. And it offers the second as proof of the first. Right? We understand that proof, prophecy proves inerrancy of Scripture. Isaiah 46 says this. Remember what happened long ago. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there no other is like me. I declare the end from the beginning. And from long ago... What is not yet done, saying, My plan will take place, and I will do all my will. God said He was going to do this, didn't He? He said, From long ago, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning. I'm going to do that. So, as in Daniel 7, we see God doing exactly what He said He was doing. He's declaring the end from the beginning. He's, he's making a prophetic announcement about the end times of humanity. We see God telling His people, about what's to come. Let's dig into Daniel 7 right now. Daniel 7, verse 1 through 3. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream with visions in his mind as he was laying in his bed. He wrote down the dream, and here is the summary of his account. Daniel said, In my vision at night, I was watching, and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. Four huge beasts came up from the sea, each different. From the other. Okay, so we got a time mark here. Daniel said he, he, this came to him during the time of Belshazzar and Babylon. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Belshazzar and Babylon. He was the half king that threw a party and got, over, and got ran out of town by, by the Medo Persian army, if you remember. Uh, so what Daniel's saying is I wrote this when old Belshazzar was still in charge. As far as Daniel knew, Babylon. Was, was, wasn't was going anywhere. He, he had no inclination to, 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 maybe he could watch the time, maybe he had a slight inclination, but he, there's no way he could have known specifics. During the time of Belshazzar, it says, before the, the Medo-Persian army ever de de uh, defeated them. But that's important. It's important that we see, and we're going to see why in a second, but just keep that in mind. Daniel wrote this during the time of Belshazzar, the, the half king. And Daniel had this vision, this vivid dream about a great sea. He didn't name the sea, did he? He didn't say, oh, it was the Mediterranean, or oh, it was, he just said it was a great sea. Sea that he didn't recognize. Well, Re Revelation tells us uh, more about the sea that Daniel saw. In Revelation 17, 15, it says, and he said to me, the waters you saw were the prostitute, where the prostitute was seated, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So it's a, it's a sea of people is what this represents. And then the four winds, we see that we read about the four winds of heaven coming. The four winds speaks to the four directions on a company, north, south, east, and west. The four winds coming um, speaks to devastation and destruction. God dealing with things. Jeremiah 49, 36 and 37. I will bring the four winds against Elam. From the four corners of heaven heavens. And I will scatter them to all the winds. There will not be a nation to which Elam's banished ones will not go. I will devastate Elam before the enemies, before those who intend to take their lives. I will bring disaster on them, my burning anger. This is the Lord's declaration. I will send the sword after them until I finish them off. 
So these four winds from heaven are, are God's hand on things. God's knowledge of what's going on. This isn't happening without his authority, without his knowledge of it, without his allowing it to happen. we got to know that. When I think back to, to, the, to the great flood, God brought some, some wind and, and some things in a great sea. And he, and he said he would never do that again. But this does, it does have types and shadows in my, in my mind to, to that, you know, as far as God's judgment coming. He's going to let people judge themselves. He's going to let these four beasts have their way. So we see Daniel's vision of a great multitude of people, many nations and languages being represented by the sea. With four winds from heaven coming in every direction, God's presence is there. God knows what's going on. He's not naive to this. He's not in the background just saying, well, whatever happens, happens. God, is, God knows what's happening here. And God is going to use what's happening here for his glory and for his purposes and for his will on earth. But four huge beasts come out of the sea, it says, each different from the other. I don't know if you've ever dug into this much, but if you look on any Google search, the beasts of Daniel 7, and you look at the pictures, there's like hundreds, hundreds of pictures. He does, Daniel does give a pretty cool account of uh, uh, of what the, what the beasts all look like. He describes them all pretty good. We're going to get to that in a second. But these pictures, I'm not sure they do it justice. Like, it, it talks about a great sea of people. A great sea, huge. I don't know that Daniel can see the other side of it. And these beasts that come out of it, um, I don't think the pictures on, on Google do it any justice. You know, I, think our, I think our holy imaginations are much better at visualizing these beasts. You know, when you think about a great sea, what, what do you think of when you think of the biggest thing in the sea? Like a whale? Well, I mean, what about like, what about like a cruise ship that size, that magnitude? Maybe. What about, what about an island coming up out of the sea? What if the beasts are that big coming up out of the sea? You know, we don't know. But I don't believe the pictures that you see on on, on line are are going to be able to do it justice. I think our imaginations are going to serve us better in these areas. So four huge beasts coming up out of the sea. Daniel describes them as huge. That alone tells me that he didn't have a better word than huge. <laughs> you know, when I run out of words, I just go with, with the ones I know. Huge. So, let's continue. Daniel 7, 4 and 6, 4 through 6. It says, Daniel says, the first was like a lion that had eagle's wings. And I continued watching until its wings were torn off. It was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. Suddenly another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. After this, while I was watching, suddenly another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. It had four heads. It was given dominion. These are the descriptions that Daniel gives us of the first three beasts that he saw, the first three. So we get a pretty good idea of their appearance. We got them. we got a lion with wings. We've got a bear raised up on one side with, with ribs in his teeth. We got a leopard with with uh, four wings and four heads. Kind of hard to, to really wrap our minds around, probably. But uh, the magnitude is is not even I don't think it's something we can fathom. Uh, that's just something that kept coming to me is is the magnitude of these beasts and what they represent. And that's the next question: What do these beasts represent? What what is the point? Of this, why would God see fit to let Daniel write this in the Scripture? Why would this be something that we need to know? Well, these beasts, as we'll find out later on in Daniel seven, all represent kingdoms. They all represent kings, earthly kingdoms and empires that ruled on the earth. So, what would that mean for for Daniel during his time in Babylon? What would this vision mean? Daniel had, like I said earlier, Daniel had this vision during King Belshazzar, Belshazzar of, of Babylon rule. Okay, well the first beast, this, this lion with wings, represents Babylon. Babylon often represented itself as a lion with wings. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar um, always used the lion as, his, as in, his insignia, like that was his thing. And we know from the story of the seven years that King Nebuchadnezzar was in the, in the wild, he was put up on his hind feet and give it a human heart and human mind. He, that happened literally. We can see that happen. 
Well, the second beast we see is the bear, raised up on one side with, with bones between his teeth. That represents the Medo-Persian army, lumbering army, just coming in. And, and they say that the one side is raised up more because the, the Persians are, are greater than, the, than the, uh, the Medes. So that's why they were, it, was, it was a little crooked. We see the bear come and, and rule and devour and gorge itself on the flesh. And then we see a leopard with four heads and four wings. This leopard represents Greece, the Greek army, that King uh, Alexander the Great led. And, and the reason it's a leopard with four wings is because it was, it was swift. This army was on point. They would just, they just took over the world quick. Think about the speed of a leopard. Think about the speed of a leopard with four wings. Quickly took over the world with Alexander the Great leading the way. And then the four heads, it says that when Alexander the Great perished when he died, he didn't have a biological son or a family member to give his kingdom to, so he split the kingdom between four generals. That's our four heads on beast. And that's, and that's where we, we see those, those three beasts lining up with, with history. So there, there isn't really much debate about that, um, about what those, what those three represent. Biblical scholars and students alike uh, agree that, that those are the three empires represented by those three beasts. Babylon, the lion was Babylon, the bear was the Medo-Persian army, and the leopard was Greece. So, as Daniel saw these visions and, and had them explained, he, he, he realized he's seeing something that's, that's prophetic. It's not something that has happened. It's something that's coming in the future because of the timing of it. Something that's yet to come. Daniel realized he had something supernatural happening in these visions. This demonstrates to us something more important about God's word. It talks about how we can understand God's word as, as true for what's to come. Because we know it's true for what was behind. So we can know it's true for what's to come. This demonstration to us demonstrates to us some important things about God's word when it talks about the future. Get this, when, it, when God's word talks about the future, there's three things that we should that we should really understand. The first one is this. Principle one, God knows the future. We know that. God knows the future. He has a plan. And he has proven it in his word repeatedly. Over and over, prof prophecy in God's word has come true. We have to understand that. God knows the future. We don't. And I'll be honest. I don't like trying to, to teach prophecy. It's not my favorite thing. It's trippy. It's, it's hard to get your mind wrapped around it well. It's, uh, there's a lot of things that represent other things, and there's stuff that represents other stuff, and, and you really have to have insight to understand prophecy well. You, you can't just off the cuff. You have to really want to understand prophecy to understand it. But God's word, prophecy in God's word, is him giving us further proof of the inerrancy of his word, of his wisdom, of his love for you and me. God's word, God's prophecy proves all those things. I don't want to say that. I can't say that enough. That's, that's what I get out of prophecy more than anything else is, is, is it proves how, how accurate God's word truly is. This vision in Daniel 7 is both fulfilled, has been fulfilled, and is yet to come. The beasts represent the near future for Daniel. These four beasts, these three beasts represent near future for Daniel. They, they represent way history for us. But, but that's, there's still something yet to come in this, in this prophecy. We're going to get to that in a second. To Daniel, it was all future. It was all. For us, it's, it's a little bit of both. And that's amazing to me. The second principle is, while we have God's prophetic word and may understand some things that are to come. Like I said, we have a, a puzzle box with a picture of, of the big picture. There is still uncertainty in its, in its fulfillment. Do we understand that? You've maybe seen the books of what 2012, end of the world, or blah, 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 end of the world, or this date at the end of the world. It's easy to take what we do know in Scripture, this, this prophetic knowledge that we do have, and go way overboard on it. And, and try, to, try to now articulate or, or extrapolate it out to mean something that God never said. You know, we can't get wrapped up in that stuff. We can use God's word, his, his prophetic word, to, to show us, to prove his, his accuracy in Scripture, to give us an over, oversight of what's coming, but to try to understand details and the minor stuff, 
You're gonna waste our we're gonna waste our time on that. We're gonna wait. Let's let's take it for what it's worth. It, it validates God's word. It proves God's word, and it gives us an over, overall picture of what's to come. It gives us the weather forecast. It doesn't give us the number of raindrops, right? And, and just as a in principle number three, sorry about that. As we read God's great plans for kingdoms and empires and these beasts and all the stuff they represent, always remember He has a specific plan and purpose for you. God has a prophecy for your life. You got prophecy for you. He's got plans for you. You know that's another thing we can take away from reading from reading prophecy in Scripture. Yeah, God knows the big picture. He knows empires and kings and all the stuff that's going to happen, but he also knows the littlest detail of your life. And he has a plan. But that's something we, we definitely don't walk away from reading scripture or reading prophecy with, is, is this, this knowledge of God knows everything. And he's got it in the palm of his hand, and he knows. And he might just use a little nobody like me or you to impact some of this big stuff that we see in the scripture. Oftentimes, he uses the individual to impact the great. He uses the small at the top of the great, always. So let's go, let's go back to Daniel 7 and 8. After, after this, while I was watching in the night vision, suddenly a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful, and incredibly strong, with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed, and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different from all the beasts before it. It had ten horns. While it was considering the horns, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up from them, came up from among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. And suddenly in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a human and a mouth that was speaking arrogantly. All right, now we're getting into some stuff here. We're getting into some stuff. Fourth beast, not compared to an animal. You see that? All the rest of them he compared to a different animal. This one, there was no animal. There was nothing that Daniel could articulate to say it was like. It just says it was incredibly strong, frightening, and dreadful. It's different than all the rest, more vicious, more ferocious. Its dominion was mightier, more destructive than any of the others. So what empire would this represent? Well, this one we're talking Rome. This is the Roman Empire. Uh, different than the rest. You know, the beast represents Rome, who indeed was different than all. The, the dominion of Rome far exceeded all the other dominions, all the other powers that came before it. Rome ruled and reigned with authority, and they reigned for almost a thousand years. Like, Rome was a whole different level of beast in the first three. A whole different level. And, and here's Daniel prophesying about this. He had no, no clue. And here he is, here's God giving him these supernatural words to share. And from this beast, these ten horns, I visualize it here, I don't know why, could have been on his back, I don't know, but from these ten horns, we see three ripped out and one small horn come up, speaking arrogantly, some bizarre little face on this horn, speaking arrogantly, boastful, and dominating great horns that were bigger. It overtakes three horns and takes their place. It's intelligent. This, this, this concept of eyes, this human eyes, in, uh, represent intelligence in the Bible. It had human eyes and spoke pompous words. This little horn represents a leader that comes, and we don't know what that represents yet. I can say, without a doubt, we don't know. You know, some we, we call it the Antichrist. We call it uh, a ruler that's yet to come. We don't know. But if we look at it, literally, it's on the beast that represents Rome. So does that mean it comes from Rome? I don't know. God hasn't told us that. But if we take it literally, that's what it looks like. But again, it took over some horns. So to say that we understand it would be a, a gross misrepresentation. Again, we don't want to take scripture, take prophecy, and, and extrapolate, try to make things that we don't see. We don't know. But we know the horn's bad. <laughs> And we know the horn is going to be problematic and speaking arrogantly and boastful. 
and it's going to overtake some other things. Let's continue 7 and 10. Or I'm sorry, 7, 9 and 10. As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head was like the whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The great, or the court, was convened, and the books were open. So what a contrast we see here. We go from the description of these beasts, these ugly, filthy beasts with horns and, and whatever they're doing, and death, to now we're in the presence of the Ancient One. I love that, that name that Daniel uses to describe God. The, one, the Ancient of Days. <coughs> Outside of time, outside of, of what we understand time to be, existed from before we, we can even fathom it, and he's going to be forever, before, as long as we can possibly ever think of. God is there. And, and the Ancient of Days takes his seat, and court is in session. Ten thousands upon ten thousands, ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him to be judged. For the Lord. With this appearance of white and fire representing uh, all the elements of God's judgment and purification, we see thousands serving him, probably angels serving him, and tens of thousands of ten thousands, all of humanity before God to give an account someday. All people before the throne with the books open, God. Again, we could try to draw a picture, but I don't think they would even come close to doing this justice. We can't even fathom it. But let your imagination run wild on that. What, what that might look like, what that might be. God holds every human life accountable. In some way, in some form, you're going to have to answer. And, and that's going to be scary, isn't it? Because there's some stuff. And we've repented and we've let Jesus have it. But we're still going to give account. So this, this shift of scenes here um, from, from heaven, or from, from these beasts, to, to the throne of heaven, to the Ancient of Days. And now we're, now we're going to shift back to the fourth beast. And it says in 11 through 14, I watched. Then, because of the sound of the arrogant words, the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts... Their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night vision, and suddenly one, like the Son of Man, was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Amen. Amen. We know what we're dealing with here, don't we? We know that's our Savior. That's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So, beast to heaven, back to beast, and now back to heaven with Jesus coming in on the clouds. The Son of Man. Back to the courtroom. The, the beast is killed. The beast is gone. And thrown in the fire. We know what that means as well. Eternal judgment. It's like God was showing Daniel the cause and the result and then we have the solution coming on the clouds all in one vision ending with the son of man Jesus himself being set in charge over all given an everlasting dominion that will have no end here's Daniel 500 years before Jesus birth to Mary talking about our, our savior he spoke of his power and his authority over all. Son of man. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Daniel wrote these words, son of man, before Jesus ever came to earth. And here is Jesus on his earthly ministry. What do you always call himself? The son of man. And, and sometimes we misunderstand what Jesus was saying when he called himself the son of man. He wasn't saying, uh, I'm just a guy. He was saying, son of man, know your scripture, know Daniel. Know what Daniel was talking about. 
The one that he calls the Son of Man, the coming on the clouds and setting everything right and making everything right, that's me. Mm -hmm. Jesus is telling us the whole time, that was me. That's me that does that. I'm the one that, that defeats the little horn. I'm the one that brings balance back to the world. I'm the one that saves lives. I'm the one that has the everlasting dominion. Not just a human guy who, who knew a lot of stuff. The son of man. And Daniel goes on. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was deeply distressed within me. And the visions in my mind terrified me. I approached one of those who was standing by and asked him to clarify all of this. So, he's, so he let me know the interpretation of these things. These huge beasts, four in number, are, the, are four kings who will rise from the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. And brethren and sisters, when this happens, it's going to all be different. It's going to all be different. We're not going to be standing firm and loving love in a culture of compromise. We're going to be glorifying God and worshiping and, and rejoicing. And we don't have to fight for it. We don't have to struggle through it anymore. We don't have to wade through the hate and all the pop problems we have. We, the burdens are gone. And we're rejoicing because we know Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. We know. We have him now. You know, Daniel speaks of being terrified. He says, I was deeply distressed. Maybe it was the judgment of God that, that distressed him. Maybe that's what the fear was. I think we should have some, some righteous fear of God's judgment on humanity. Daniel didn't know the way that would play out Jesus being the Savior of the world. I mean, he saw it here, but maybe he didn't grasp it. Maybe that's why he felt fear, because he knew he had to give a count. But we don't have to. We have our Lord. And he's washed us white as snow, just like God, just like the appearance of God was white as snow. Jesus has washed us white as snow through his blood. And we can rejoice in that. Yes, yeah, should we have a, a healthy fear of the Lord? Absolutely. But we know we're secure. And when we stand before God in that, in that judgment, there's only going to be one thing to say. I'm in I trust in Jesus. I trust in Jesus. That's all I've got. I didn't do much right. But I trusted Jesus with my, with my life. And that's a good, that's a, that can give us hope through this, through this prophetic word. So there's a lot that we don't know. Let's be honest. There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about the little horn. We don't know who he is, what time it is, his name. Or, we don't know any of that stuff. But we do know something a whole lot more important. We know that Jesus is victorious in the end. We know that the holy ones of the Most High are going to be members, are going to be residents of this eternal, everlasting kingdom and possess it forever and ever. Daniel says, these visions grieved him. And I get that. But we don't have to be scared. We can live in authority and through Jesus Christ. We have no doubt. And here, listen, Daniel saw what these kingdoms brought. He saw the pain and the, the, the death toll that happened through, through persecution and the hate of the, of the Holy Ones. We're going to face some stuff. We've been facing some stuff. We're going to continue to face some stuff until the day we go home. We, but we must be ready to endure. We must be ready to stand firm and love well until that day. Whatever difficulty or persecution or pain comes our way, we know how it ends. We've seen the end. God gave us a, a sneak peek. We know the ending. It almost feels unfair, doesn't it? Like, we already, we already know. Call it faith, but it, we know. Like, we know. We know where we stand. We have, we have to bear it for now, though. We have to stand firm for now. 1 Peter 5, 10, 11 says, The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be the dominion forever.
That sounds like it's talking about the scripture to me, doesn't it? We're going to struggle for a little while. We're going to fight through it for a while. We're going to have some stuff going on that we don't like for a little while. But keep that in mind. It's a little while. Even 90 years here, 100, however long you may live, God refers to it as a little while compared to what's ahead. Amen? Amen. Let's wrap this up. Seek to understand biblical prophecy, yes. Allow prophecy to confirm God's word in all areas so that you will know. So you'll be ready and able to stand firm and love well to the end, knowing an everlasting kingdom awaits you. And there's one more piece of this. Jesus wins. We, we already know the end. Amen? All right. Amen. All right, let's, is there any, uh, let's talk about this.